you to say good morning to someone you haven't said it to yet. Tell them how beautiful they are. Anita, Anita, this mic is way really too loud. Um, just tell them how beautiful they look. Hallelujah. <laughs> We welcome you if you're watching on Facebook this morning. Hallelujah, this place is ready to rock How many of you have the Holy Spirit in your heart and in your life today? Amen. We couldn't do without the Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us. Amen. Mark, you look awesome. Everybody turn around there and say, Mark, you look awesome.
makes a difference in our lives. It might be a smile. It might be a handshake. It might be a hug. Yes. Whatever it is, you can change your atmosphere, and you can also change someone else's atmosphere. You know, if I walk up to Ethan and I say, "How you doing, brother?" Nice shirt. Like nice smile. Or I can just walk past him. Sounds like it, but but it didn't stick. 
in my mind would wonder while I'm reading, and then I think, well, what's the point, Lord? You know, I can't remember anything. So, you know. But I've also learned that if you share something, if you share it, and so I started bouncing things off of Jeff more, which helps me remember. But this, when I read something through the week, and I think, there's more people out there that need to know this. If it hits me, I know that there, I'm not, I know we're all different. Yes, we're all different, but we're all alike, too. And we all have the same needs. And I thought, I had never seen this before where it says, I'm reading in Ecclesiastes, and I'm thinking, ugh, it's a downer. <laughs> it's all, woe is me, and all sorts of, you know, it's not the most uplifting book in the world, in the Bible, I should say, but... But there's, there's some nuggets in there that I that you can get a, hang on to. And what I found, I think, was 8, 8, 4, it says, Where the word of a king is, there is power. Yep. Yes, yes. And who may say unto him, What doest thou? In the word of a king. Thank you. 
who you say I am, Gabriel, is what it's under. Look at someone and say, you are who God says you are. Miss Jackie was talking about speaking it. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah.
you, dear. child of God, go ahead and give him another clap off. Hallelujah. But you're glad for Jesus. Saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the, that's the word of the Lord for his house and his, and his people. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise the Lord. We're running. Great place to be. Amen. I'll let you, I guess we're ready for the kids to head back for the Sunday school classes. A few older kids can hang in here. Tonight. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I'll let you determine how that how how you uh, respond to that. So. Praise God. Hallelujah. Good to have Hope House in the house this morning. Amen. Amen. Glad you're here. Glad you came to fellowship with us today. We appreciate the work that you're doing and what God is doing in your midst. And, and uh, we uh, celebrate the goodness and the favor of God upon your, upon your mission and upon your lives. Praise the Lord. For some, I know it's been a long time coming, but it's come. So, amen. So, receive that and, and uh, just uh, allow it to uh, situate and settle. I've got some stuff to share today. This is Pentecost Sunday. And I'm going to get into some stuff today and pull some things together. If you were here Wednesday night... You, you will, there will be a familiar sound to some of this for you. If you were not and, uh, and you joined us online, there will be a familiar sound. If you haven't been able to do that, I would encourage you to, uh, uh, to make the use of, uh, make use of the archive that we have built, particularly over the time of COVID. I don't, there's been very few services that we haven't that we haven't uh, recorded and put out there. It's either on Facebook or YouTube. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of folks, particularly for our, our Sunday school teachers. And, and, uh, and, you know, if you can't be here consistently and you want to know what's going on, then you have an opportunity. You may have to dig it out yourself. And, and, uh, but there is uh, there's a resource out there for... Uh, for your benefit, and so I want to encourage you to do that. I'm not trying to to uh, toot my own horn here. I'm just trying to uh, realize that you know sometimes when we can't make it, we don't realize what we missed. And so what I want you to understand is is that when God speaks and God brings things out about His Word, that there's always some benefit for it and to us in that regard. And so I want to encourage you. To, uh, I want to encourage you to study for yourself. So the scripture says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And it also says that, you know, that, that, we, are to, that we are to be attentive and to hear and to listen, uh, you know, and to receive from the word and the word of the Lord and the structure that we have here. So I want to encourage you to do that. If you haven't done that, I want to encourage you to make the most of it, maximize it. Because there's a lot of folks that don't really know sometimes what's going on, right? What exactly is happening? Well, you know, it, it, there's, a, there's a way to figure that out and find that out. So uh, you can have a better idea of it if you will consistently, uh, you know, make your, uh, um, 
just put yourself in a position to benefit and prosper from the Word of God. Because I believe that that's, I believe that's the, I believe that's an important, incredible aspect of everything that we're doing. And so when we think of, you think of prosperity gospel, you think bank accounts and big cars and all that kind of stuff, and that's not, uh, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the word that develops you, that matures you, that adds substance to you, that gives you the ability to stand your ground when you know when you know you have to stand your ground and put your feet down on the rock so when the storms of life come, you aren't shaken, you aren't easily shaken, you aren't easily overwhelmed or overcome. You're like a tree planted by the water that shall not be moved. Amen. So, I, I, and all of that falls into the prosperity category from from where I'm standing, because there's so many folks that are that are uh, uh, so uh, how do I say it that just not as well established in the word as they uh, as they could be, and uh, I think there's not very many of us that would be immune to think that statement didn't apply to us. I know that I know I'm still getting stuff that that uh, helps me so all right that was a disclaimer i had planned on getting into so there you go how about that a freebie to start with cool. we are glad you're here uh we're going to go to acts chapter 2 this being pentecost sunday i'm going to read the first 21 verses and before you moan and roll your eyes <laughs> I want you to understand I'm not going to preach on all of that, but I'm going to refer to it. As a, I, I'm, I'm a big picture guy, but I, but I also get caught in details. And to understand big picture, sometimes you got to see you got you have to see how how we got to the big picture, right? You have to see how the steps that were made and the things that happened. And so there's some there's some interesting stuff. I titled this message Pentecost Fulfilled. And I did it for a particular reason. Uh, and uh, one of the things that, that, that I want you to think about, I'm going to say some things today and pull some things into this that probably, I won't say you haven't heard definitively. Uh, I, I'm going to say that there's probably, there probably hasn't been a lot of it out there. There may be some folks that are doing it. I know for me, I started seeing some things click and pull together in when I was looking at this that I hadn't before. So this is uh, this is kind of fresh ground for me as well. So uh, let's start with uh, let's let's go here. Let's let, we we set the back Wednesday night. We talked about the days of his passion and that for forty days he for forty days after his passion he spoke to his disciples pertaining to the kingdom of God. Right, so he spent 40 days with them talking kingdom. He spent 40 days with them giving them direction, giving them, uh, uh, helping them, uh, uh, you know, find their way and settle their hearts into what was in front of them to do. And and I believe there was some healing that, that transpired that took place. Uh, uh, most of the disciples fled when Jesus was taken the night that he was crucified. They all ran, as the scripture says, smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter, right? And so they all scattered. So let me just say this, their confidence level in themselves was not high. They were kind of like a lot of us. They thought, well, you know, I, I've made so many mistakes. I've done so many things wrong. I've, I've, I've failed on, on such a... So, you know, when it mattered most, because I'll tell you what, when, you're, when your teacher is overwhelmed and taken captive and you run and, and, or, or you react strongly and you take off, then the, you're going to feel like you failed him, right? If nothing else, you're going to feel like you should have behaved, you should have acted differently. And so these guys were, these guys were, uh, and gals, I'm going to say it this way, were all trying to recover, if you will, from their, from, from that, that moment that, that they weren't sure didn't define them as believers. Jesus knew it didn't because he had plans for them that were great, right? He had a state, he was setting a stage for them much grander and bigger than they had ever imagined. 
You know, I mean, you look at them and, you, and, and they had to think, you know, I'm just an old fisherman from, uh, you know, from Galilee or, or I'm just a tax collector. Nobody likes me. Uh, nobody wants to hear what I've got to say. Or I'm a, I'm a zealot. I'm one of the aggressive and violent, I uh, have an aggressive and violent background and, and, and people are a little uncomfortable with me. He's meshing and pulling all these personalities together, right? And all of them scattered. All of them didn't know what to do. Their expectation of the moment was so different than the moment itself that they were, they found themselves a kind of a stunned and astonished and, and, and absolutely shaken to the very core. And so these 40 days, he spends with them just pouring into them and speaking to them and healing their wounds and pouring in the oil and the wine of his wisdom and his grace and his love and his mercy. Letting them see his compassion, letting them, letting them begin to recover and feel like that they that, that it wasn't the end of the world. So he's then he when he departs, he says, you know, Terry in Jerusalem, wait here for the promise of the Father. And I talked about some of this Wednesday night, so I'm gonna try not to re-preach Wednesday. But one of the things he does is he refers them and takes them back to the initial thing. This is what John the Baptist said, right? What's going to happen to you was what, this is where you got your start. You all started figuring out and finding out that I was on the planet, that I was in play, that the Messiah was here because of the testimony of John. And when the religious leaders asked John, are you the one? And he says, I am not him, but there comes, he's coming after me and he's mightier than I am. And I'm not worthy to bear his shoes. I'm not worthy to stoop down and unloose his shoes. But, but he, I baptize with water, but he baptizes with the Holy Ghost and with fire. His fan is in his hand. So John was saying he's going to do something. And Jesus said, Jesus said in the first chapter of Acts, that he said what John said. I, you know, the, the baptism that John told you about. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's what's, that's what's next on your radar. Hang together and stay there in Jerusalem until, until the, the promise becomes unmistakably apparent to you. Now, they didn't know what that meant anymore sometimes than when... When you read the word and you, you and I look at it, you wonder exactly what that means for our life today, right? So you have to kind of have a little patience and you have to kind of stand there and, 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 and keep the word engaged and active within your heart and within your mind so that, so that when the manifestation of the promise becomes apparent or is, is, you know, materializes in your life, you recognize it and you can receive it as the handiwork and promise of God for you. Amen? So... They've been hanging out in an upper room for 10 days. Now, I'm going to shift some things around. I had to, some things shifted around for me in this, and I, I hope I don't overlook some of these details. <clears throat> but this says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. I want to hold that for just a minute because I want to talk about fully come. The phrase in Greek means to fill completely. And so what I'm looking at here, what began to settle on me this past week was that, was that as Christ fulfilled the Passover, right? All of the Passovers from Exodus forward were all projected prophetic pictures, images, or more biblically stated, literally, they were sacred rehearsals. All right, in the book of Leviticus, when it talks about them, to calls them holy convocations, it means sacred rehearsal. So what's happening, God's, re I'm rehearsing something. You're walking through this. It's a dramatization for the real event. It's a dramatization for the real thing, right? It's a rehearsal. It's not the real thing, but it's a rehearsal. So all of those Passovers, through all of the ages and through all of the generations, 
continue to under uh, to underscore and highlight for Israel that there was a sense, a moment of salvation, a redeeming moment, a moment that would take you out of Egypt, a moment that would bring you out of sin, a moment that would change your life and change your outlook and change your atmosphere. So when Jesus came and John says, Behold the Lamb of God, now we're on part, now we're on point. Now we understand that the Passover lambs that existed and, and were slaughtered before him were all pointing to him and his sacrifice, right? Amen. So when Jesus gives himself on the cross on that Passover, and at three o'clock in the afternoon on that fateful day, when the priest is at the at the brazen altar and he takes the sacrificial knife across the throne of the lamb, the priest says it is finished, and he says the sacrifice is finished on Calvary at three o'clock. Your high priest and my high priest is crying out to the heavens as he's bleeding. It is finished. Amen. So what had been in type and shadow and prophetic imagery was brought to completion and fulfillment. You say, well, but people celebrate Passover now. They still celebrate it. I know they do, but, uh, but, but that's because they don't realize how it's been finished and how it's been fulfilled. Now, in the same sense that Jesus fulfilled Passover, and in the way that he brought the Feast of first fruits or the Feast of Weeks in the manifestation. I'm not going to get into that today. I spent three Wednesdays on that. Again, it's archived. If you want to, you want to listen to that, get in there and listen to it. I'll encourage you to do that. Praise the Lord. But this Pentecost is showing up, and this is this has power in it. So Pentecost is 50, 50 days, right? So from the Sabbath day after the Passover, they begin to count 49 days until, so it's the 50th day, including the Sabbath day, that there is a, that Pentecost comes. It's the wheat harvest. It has its beginning because 50 days after the Passover, when they fled Egypt, Moses went on Mount Sinai and received the law. In Jewish custom, tradition, and manifestation, it is the feast of the giving of the law. And I will say this, that's probably why there's so much law in some of our Pentecostal assemblies. I'll just lay that out there and move on. Anyway. Jesus has set this up for this feast to be fulfilled on the same, on a similar scale to how Passover was fulfilled. So what Pentecost is, is prepared, what's happening in this text that we read is the old idea and the long established rehearsal and projection See, what was the giving of the law? Let's look at it this way. The word, the, the word being given to men. That, that, that it was time for men to accept and receive the word of God into their lives, right? So you can make it that case. And Jesus is the word. And so they're about to receive the word of life into their life by the power of his presence. That's one way to look at it. And that's, that's totally uh, fine and dandy to look at it that way. And that's how it's... But it's also, it begins to bring out a different context. It shows beyond that. It's not just that. There's more to it. When the day of Pentecost was fulfilled, when it was filled completely, when it was brought to fulfillment, they were all with one accord in one place. Next verse, please. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. So hold me right here for a minute. Because there's some stuff I need to get out of this and pull out of here. So it's possible I may not get through all 21 verses. 
<laughs> Way back then. Yeah. Imagine that, right? Praise the Lord. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. So let me submit something to you. And, and if I get there, hopefully I can... Uh, you know, we have the idea, the long standing, and of course we have songs that back this up, and so that's, we think that all this happens in the upper chamber, right? We think it all happens up there. I'm not sure, when you start to look at the scale of what happens here, that it's physically possible for it to have happened in an upper chamber that probably had, uh, had I don't, you know, 120 people pretty, pretty packed in there, right? Anyway, I'm not going to tell you that it absolutely didn't, but I'm going to submit an alternate point of view here. Yeah. And that is that it being, when you get over in here, you're going to find out it's the third hour of the day, right? Yeah. That means it's 9 o'clock in the morning. That's prayer time at the temple. Yeah. So it's entirely possible that what's going to happen here, that as they were prepared and they were in one accord in that upper room and in that space, that they had taken that that sense of purpose and that, that singleness of mind and they had they had migrated to the temple to say there to, to participate in the Jewish prayer time and as they were as they were in the house something powerful takes place. You know, when it says one accord, it didn't mean they believed in, in everything the same. It didn't mean they were the same political persuasion. It didn't mean they were the same uh, on every uh, point of doctrine. It meant that they had a singleness of purpose and a singleness of mind. They, had, they were in complete agreement that the promise was coming, that Messiah had been there. They were locked into that demonstration and, that, and their participation in that was unshakable. And so they were in one accord. Praise the Lord. And so a new expression is about to be set forth. Suddenly, yeah. without warning, there's this sound. Yeah. Now, think about this for a minute. Because you've got the court of men, you've got the court of women, and you have some in the outer court. Uh, no doubt there is that you've got... You have some of the believers are kind of in all of these different places. And remember, the veil in the temple has been rent. Now, whether they've gotten it repaired in 50 days or not, I can't speak to that. Whether they fixed it or not or repaired the breach in that amount of time, I can't speak to that. But I'm going to tell you something. There came a sound from heaven. From their vantage point in the Jewish perspective, the most holy place was the throne room of God. And they regarded that as the spot particularly of heaven on earth. So the sound that came, came out of heaven. Somewhere behind what was a veil that had been rent at the resurrection of Jesus, there was a sound that began something starts coming out of the most holy place. And it doesn't do it quietly. It doesn't show up timidly. It doesn't... It doesn't manifest itself in meekness or in, or in softness, but in authority and in power and in glory and in manifestation. It starts, sounds like a train coming through the house. Wind can make that sound. If you've ever listened to people who've talked about experiencing a tornado, they will tell you it sounded like a locomotive. They'll tell you it had this, this, this powerful sound that was, that was unmistakable. So if you, can, if you can consider the reality of this, that, that, that suddenly there's this sound. It's like there's a whirlwind. It's like there's a, 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 a powerful force that is generated and flowing out of heaven. And it's filling the house. It's affecting everybody in it. Praise the Lord. So, a rushing mighty wind. The Aramaic says this, and I like this. Like the roar, like the roar of a groaning spirit. So I started thinking about this, that this week. The roar of a groaning spirit. And I got to thinking about the instances where, you know, Jesus 
grow. And it, the most common is, of course, the tomb of Lazarus. Why? I, you know, there's a lot of debate about some of that stuff. But he's, I believe the groan in him is now amplified. I believe the desire to bring life to the world, the desire to, to let the manifestation of the conquest of death be the voice of the, of the church in this hour. I believe there's so much involved in this. Jesus groaned within himself when he saw the mourning and when he heard the tears and he even wept himself at the tomb of Lazarus. But he groaned within himself. There was something in him that rose up to, to stand and to, to declare the life of God in the face of death and discouragement and mourning. And I guarantee you that he turned mourning into dancing that day just like he's going to do here. Hallelujah. So the roar of a groaning spirit, so you take the, the groan of an individual, of a human being in a setting like that, and you look at him and you he has ascended on high and he is giving gifts unto men and he is ready now to pour out of that same groan to affect lives, that same groan to heal humanity, that same groan is amplified, it is magnified because it flows from the heavens. I'm about to get excited. Imagine that. A rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Praise the Lord. So there's a lot going on here. It is this. Let's go to our next verse. So there's this phenomenon, this manifestation of power that is audible to all those that are gathered around. There is this, there is this sensation of wind blowing that is not just audible, it is tangible. They can feel it. They can, they're experiencing it in real time, right? Yeah. And so there's something else that's taking place here. Because you see, everything that had happened at the first Pentecost was being presented and redefined. Years ago, I did a message called The Elements Melt. And whereas most of the time we look at that as the, as the earth falling apart, dissolving, or whatever, what I did with it, what I, what I felt impressed the Holy Spirit to do was take it and look at the elements of the old and see them as being melted down and then be recast into another form and into a new image and a new likeness and a new manifestation. Anyway, so it is possible here that we're watching, what we're hearing is the elements melt. Remember, on that day, that fateful day in Exodus when Moses went up and a cloud received him out of their sight. That day that Moses went up and the whole mountain trembled and shook and burned with fire. That whole day when everybody was fearful and they were, and they, they said, you go up for us. If, if, if an animal touches the, just as much as touches uh, the mountain, it's going to be thrust through in the dark where it's going to kill us. If we get too close to it, we're afraid. Yeah. So awful, so terrible was the sight. The scripture says that Moses himself said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Hallelujah. But then in, in Hebrews 12, he tells us we're not come to that mountain to burn with fire and blackness. We've been brought to a different mountain, right? We're now at Mount Zion. We're on a different place. We're, we're approaching God from a different vantage point. Why? Because the real Passover has happened. The real Lamb of God's been slain. There's something that's taken place. There's a shifting of power here. So what's happening, in my estimation, is that what's long been the house of the Lord is discovering the house of God that comprises the new covenant. And that's the believers. That's the house that you and I are by faith, right? 
So what I started to see in this is, is that there were, there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. So I'm going to take a few minutes. I want to read this to you out of the Passion Translation. And I realize that some folks have some issues with the Passion Translation. I'm not trying to, uh, I cannot alleviate those issues. I, I cannot do that. I can understand them to some degree. All right, but I still see the value in the translation. There's still some good things in it that is that is worthwhile and worth listening to and worth looking at. Verse 3 from the Passion Translation says, Then all at once a pillar of fire appeared before their eyes. So think about this for a minute. You say, well, that's reading a whole lot into it. Well, that's part of the Aramaic vantage point of this. But, I'm not trying to compare apples and oranges here. But then he says, it separated into, into tongues of fire that engulfed each of them or rested over them. So if I could, if, if we would take a minute and just consider that in the original version of the story, as they've escaped from, the, uh, from Egypt and they have crossed the Red Sea, and they've their 50th day, God gives them the Torah, gives them the law. There's this mighty manifestation, the pillar of fire that had led them to that point, made the mountain look like it was a volcano ready to erupt. I'm just going to say it that way for visual effect. Smoke and, and, and blackness and cloud and, and heat and, 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 and everything that would be frightening and the trembling and, the, and all of that. It was like the, it's like the pillar had set right on top of the mountain. It was a burning furnace and a, and, a, and, a, and a flashing light. It was lightning and thunder, if you will. There was all this sound. Remember, there was a sound that came like, a, like the roaring of a groaning spirit, like a rushing mighty wind. See, the, the, the thunder and lightning was even preserved in the garment of the high priest. On the edge of, the, on the edge of his uh, garment, in the border of his garment, there was a pomegranate and a bell. And they altered. They were made of gold. They were altered. And what they were designed to do was reminded that when he went in, there was thunder and lightning. When Moses was face to face with God on the mountain. And so there's the sound and the fury. So we've already called and talked about the sound, right? The sound came from heaven, the thunder, the power, the, the audible display, the, the sound of it, the, the, the power in the sound. You know there's power in sound, right? Just as an illustration, just think about this for a minute. The first movie I ever saw that had surround sound or something was a movie called Earthquake. I went to the theater and saw it, and you vibrated in the chair. You know, you just, you know, the whole the whole theater vibrated like you were like you were experiencing a a, a, a tremor, right? Yeah. And so that, that sound was powerful. And I'm gonna I'll give you a, an easier example if you never had that particular uh, experience. If you will watch a movie and turn the sound off, watch a really tense scene in a movie with the sound off. And you can watch it. And then I would challenge you to go back and watch that movie with the sound on. And when the music shifts, when the music changes, what's it do? It affects your emotion, right? So there's power in sound. Okay? My, my reason for saying that is because what we hear affects us. And it, it affects our emotion. It affects us emotionally. It affects our state of mind. It, it causes your, it, it can cause your heart rate to increase, right? And when the music, when they hit that minor chord, when something you can't see is going to show up, they hit that, they hit that particular chord and you go, uh-oh, right? Why is that? Because sound is powerful. And God's already released the sound here that's powerful. And so now there is the visual aspect of this. These cloven tongues of fire came from somewhere. In the original, the pillar uh, that, that when Moses was on the mountain and the pillar of fire that, that had led them to that point, that, that when Moses was getting the commandments, Jewish tradition, you won't find this in the scripture, but Jewish tradition says that when each commandment was given to Moses, that there was a, a, a fiery demonstration that went down the mountain and spoke 
to each Jewish man that was along the, that, that was lined up, that was standing at the base of the mountain, says, will you keep this commandment? So there was this manifestation of fire. If you're going to have Pentecost, if you're going to have a slain lamb like you did a Passover, some of this stuff's going to bleed over. And so what's happening is, is we're getting it redefined. And rather than it passing by and saying, well, you keep this commandment, that pillar kind of breaks into small pieces and it positions itself and seats itself and rests upon the people of faith inside the house. And it begins to hover, it begins to say, it's not about keeping the commandment anymore. It's about the life of the king that dwells inside of you. I've come to abide in your life. Praise the Lord. So what's really happening here? Most preachers and theologians will surmise the default setting is, is that this is the birthday of the church. If you've been around here any length of time, you've heard me say that I don't necessarily lean into that particular vantage point. Because I believe she was born... When his side was open, just as Eve was born when Adam's side was open, right? Eve was extracted out of Adam's side. You have the first man, Adam, and then you have the last man, the last Adam, which is Christ. So out of his side, I believe that the strategy in opening the side on Calvary after he's dead, Adam was in a deep sleep. Jesus had went into a deep sleep, and the spirit of Rome pierced and pulled along the rim cage, and from there blood and water came out from there, and invisible to the naked eye was the woman that God had intended to bring to him for help me. Now, you say, well, well she grew up fast, right? 50 days, she's, well, you know, when Eve was extracted from Adam's side, she wasn't a baby. She wasn't an infant. She wasn't a little girl. She was a mature woman pulled out of his side, right? God pulled her out of there, and, and her shape was compatible. It was, it was efficient for Adam's need. Can I submit to you that when Jesus' side was open, that the, that the invisible bride, the bride that was coming out of the heavens, the one that had been shut up and locked away, can I call, tell you that maybe her name could be called Grace? That she comes out and she's brought out and brought into the world and still few can see her. But on this day, she steps forward. On this day, like Esther, before Xerxes, she stepped forward and put her hand on the scepter and asserted herself for such a time as this. I believe this is not the birth of the church, but the emergence of the church. I believe it is now the voice that is desired that God is using to speak into the land. I believe when Jesus came, if you go back and you study the scripture and you look at, at, the, at all of, the, all of the, the, the things in Jeremiah, chapter 7, chapter 16, I think chapter 25, where it talks about the one into captivity and that the sound of the bridegroom and the bride would no longer be heard in the land. And that means the voice of gladness, the voice of mirth, the voice of celebration, the voice of rejoicing. All of that was going to fade. Why? Because they were going into captivity. But in Jeremiah, I think it's Jeremiah 33 and 11, he talks about the, the, the restoration. And he says of that place, he says, then the, the, the voice of gladness will be heard in the land. The voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. He starts talking about the voice of joy and gladness and celebration is going to be restored. Can I submit to you that what happens here is that the full restoration of the human race has been set in motion by Calvary. Jesus came that the world might be changed. That all who believe, regardless of their affiliation, their ethnic group, their, their language, their culture, all of them could be affected powerfully by his saving grace. And so at this point, there is this tremendous, John made this statement, he, he talks about this in, uh, 
In John chapter 3, he draws attention to this and he says, he said, I'm just a friend of the bridegroom. You've been listening to the bridegroom, right? Yes, and so he says he equates Christ with the voice of the bridegroom. Can I tell you Jesus did too? When the Pharisees said to him and they challenged him and said, you know, how come your disciples don't fast and John's disciples fast? You know, and I know, I'm going to paraphrase some stuff for you because it's just fun. Okay? Sometimes I just want to have just a little bit of fun with this. And Jesus said, well, you know, ain't no pleasing you folks anyway. John, you know, John, John came, uh, you know, uh, fasting and doing these things. And you said, you know, he's a, he has a devil. And then the son of man comes eating and drinking. And you say, behold, a, 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 a gluttonous man in a wine bibber, right? That just ain't no making you happy. We've got both extremes and you find fault with everything. So there's that religious mentality that wants to find fault with everything. But when they approached him about his disciples not fasting, Jesus said to him, the children of the bridegroom and the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them. <clears throat> What's he saying? The voice of gladness is here. I'm the sound. My voice is the voice of the bridegroom. My voice is part of that equation that restores joy. It's no wonder that the influence and the impact that Jesus had on his disciples and on his generation was of such profound positivity. People just couldn't help but be encouraged. Unless you're just, you know, you're just of the opinion that you couldn't be encouraged when somehow it's wrong to be encouraged, right? Lord, we still got folk like that around. So, but the voice of the bridegroom is the first part of the equation. Now we're about to hear the voice of the bride. So, in that sense, I would submit to you that the wedding feast Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 22 is very much in play. Verses 2 through 10, the wedding feast Jesus talks about here is very much in play. I would submit to you that what's happening here as, as the Holy Spirit is equipping and, and dispensing goods and gifts that this bride is adorning herself. She is, she is discovering all that she is in this moment and now she's ready to step forward and speak. The voice of the bride is now ready to speak a word of encouragement. From this time on, I believe that the Spirit and the bride say come. It's also possible you could pull in Revelation 12 into this. There's a wonder that happens in the heavens. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon is under her feet. She has, there's this manifestation of glory that shows up and, in, and she, is, uh, she is luminous. She is brilliant. She is, she is set forward in a heavenly display in a fashion and in a form that is, cannot be ignored. So I would submit that there's some of that in play as well. I'm not going to get too deeply into that today. But that pillar of fire as it dissipates, saying the old is fulfilled, that what has been has served its purpose, that what has been long established is now taking new form, new shape. It is now breaking up and becoming and seating itself on the individual as a moment and a, and a a verification or validation of faith. Grace through faith. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And it sat upon each of them. It engulfed them. It rested over them. It hovered, if you will. And again, think about Genesis 1, where the Spirit of the Lord brooded or hovered and moved on the face of the deep. There's that fluttering. There's that spiritual movement over mankind, over creation, so that it will hear and receive the, the authority of the word to reshape it, to, to be drawn into a new expression rather than the darkened chaos of, of confusion and the swirling mass of water that it was in the beginning. 
Some of us in here have some frame of reference for that. I remember how confused and my life was swirling around and I was in darkness and I was lost and I was I was in a I was in a terrible situation and circumstance, but the Holy Spirit was brooding and fluttering, and under the shelter of his wings there was something happening in my life, and I got prepared to hear a word from the Lord, and by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. And I had a grace encounter. I heard the voice of the bridegroom. And when you hear the voice of the bridegroom and you begin to speak his story, you begin to tell him his glory, you become the voice of the bride. And wherever that story is told, there's joy, there's mirth, there's gladness, there's celebration. Where the story is not told, there is concern, despair, Disquietness. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Verse 4. I think I've covered that about as thoroughly as I can. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the others. So I'm going to talk about this for a minute. As I said before, their confidence was not at a, they hadn't peaked as far as their confidence. In fact, if any of us today, if, if the Lord would speak into somebody's life and say, I want you to, I'm going to, I'm going to give you, I'm going to put a voice in you that's going to be world, that's going to be heard worldwide. Most of us would say, if we didn't say anything, we just looked like we were going to. We would kind of, well, I'm not real sure about that. There's got to be better voices than mine for that, for that grand of scale. There's got to be something more to it than, than you know, we would, we would start to downplay to kind of uh, 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 redirect or minimize or however you want to say it. We would, you know, there's not very many folks that would just jump in there and say, yeah, I'm qualified. Right? So you can imagine these folks did not feel qualified. They just figured it was something they were going to get and they were going to have in their, in their circle, in their sphere, and probably where they were. They had no idea the magnitude of the power and the gifting that was being deposited in their life. They started getting filled with that, with the sound, not just with the sound and the and the light, but it started situating itself. When it rested on them, it filled them. Hallelujah. Like the like uh, the, uh, the the vessels or the utensils of the of the widow woman in, in the story of, of Elisha that, that you just you, as long as you pour there's no end to it. Can I tell you? Can I interest you in God who says I want to pour out my spirit on you? I want to pour my spirit out on your life, and then we start saying, okay, I want to cap it off here. The reality of it is, as long as you've got an empty pan, as long as you've got something, and even if your pan's not empty, Jabin said, my cup runneth over. God's not interested, God's not concerned nearly as much as we are about what flows out of us that we may think is wasteful. It's another reason why that woman last week was so powerful. She had all kinds of reasons not to break her precious treasure and pour it out on him. She had all kinds of reasons to say, well, you know, that's not the most practical or the most prudent or, or the most uh, uh, judicious approach to this. But it's Jesus. Hallelujah. And something moved her to say, he's worth all I can pour on him. He's worth everything I can cast on him because he's everything to me. Yes. Always let that capture your heart and your spirit. When you start feeling all judicious about stuff. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. God put them on the world stage. Again, they had to be, it was happening in the outer court. It was happening in the court of women and happening in the court of Israel, right? It's happening in all these places simultaneously because the sound's coming out of heaven and everything that's been poured out has, has absolutely 
absolutely redefined itself in the matter of faith. Next verse, please. The reason I say this, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews devout men out of every nation under heaven. So again, it's a pilgrim feast. Some of them had been there for first fruits, no doubt, and had, had made that, and they'd done it close enough that they could stay for Pentecost as well. Some of them had done it, went home and come back. Some, and and hard, it's hard to tell about the dynamic, but this was one of the three times they were compelled by the, by the Word of God to appear in Jerusalem before the Lord and not to appear empty. So they had to come with something. And so they, when they got here, they were, they were devout. The, the people that were there wanted to be there. The people that were there were come from all over, multiple nations. They were Jews, but they were they had, they didn't return to the homeland. And the, when the captivity was stored, they made their life elsewhere. Hallelujah! And so they made the pilgrimages three times a year. Next verse, please. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. What they what confounded them was was they started hearing the testimony of God in their own language which they were not expecting to happen in the temple or in Jerusalem, right? They had to brush up on their Aramaic when they came into town. Because most of them were Greek speaking, they spoke other dialects and their primary because they didn't live there in the region, they lived somewhere else, they, uh, another language was their primary language. So, so that those who struggled to understand and speak Aramaic or Hebrew fluently, God speaks to them in the language they know best. How about that for mercy? How about that for grace? How about that for God saying, I got something to tell that the world needs to hear. So not only am I going to just tell it here, and so that's what that's what was so crazy about the early church was they just they continued to settle and all you heard about all was focused on was what happened in Jerusalem. But every one of these people are going to be affected by what's happening today. And they're going to go back and they're going to share it in their corner of the world. They're going to go back to their communities, their neighborhoods. And they're going to begin to go home and talk about it. They're going to have it in a different language. They're going to have it in a different culture. They're going to begin to pierce. The world's beginning to be pierced with the idea, hallelujah, of a savior, of a deliverer, of somebody who's come not just to save Jewish people, but to save all men from their sins. Hallelujah. Verse 7, please. I think I've covered that one. They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galilee? And so the inference here, or the implication, I look for Jackie, I don't see her. She helps me with the difference between implied and inferred. Anyway, I think if it's written, it's implied. If it's in conversation, it's inferred. I'm going with that today. I might have to change it later and modify that. But anyway, so what is what is implied here is that the Galilean school system was not robust enough for them to know all these languages. They could probably understand and understood that they were Galileans because there was an accent. There was a thickness to it. Their, their form of Aramaic was a little different than the, than, the, than the southern part in Jerusalem. They were kind of northeastern or northwestern, I should say. And Jerusalem was kind of to the southeast. And so the even different dialects, just like here in the U.S., doesn't take you long to figure out who's from Alabama or who's from Boston. Or who's from good old West Virginia? And we're all speaking the same language, but there's a tail in all of it, right? And so that's not any different. I mean, it's not something that's unique to English speaking. And if you, you know, one of the things I struggle with is listening to the British speak English. It's hard for me. I know we got it from them, but you'd think they'd have mastered it better by now. <laughs> Oh, well. And that's probably what they're thinking about us. How about that? Okay. Uh, moving along, right? 
But they, see, there's this, there's this Galilean accent. There's this something about it that they can identify where they're from. And it's not a, it's not exactly the, uh, a uh, tourist destination, right? Uh, nobody really says, hey, let's go to Galilee for vacation, right? And it's, not, it's not something that people do. It's not, it's not well respected. It seems to be, uh, you know, it's not something that people look at like that. And so anyway, they're marveled. They're amazed. How are they amazed? Because God has empowered them to speak beyond their capability. They didn't know how to say they they didn't know how to speak these languages. If they knew any of it at all, it was very limited. And yet the Holy Spirit brought a fluidity to it. A, 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 they were fluent in, in how they were able to say it. Now, granted, the Galilean twang, I'll call it, showed up, you know, and they could tell that from what was going on, but it was still not, it was still the the uh, you know on the world stage. God was speaking more and more broadly, let me say it that way, than just to Jerusalem. Even though he brought everybody there, but he brought them there to hear what they could carry back, right? Praise the Lord. Next verse, please. And so, how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? How do we, how's this happening? Uh, you know, we don't understand. So the, the, they were confounded. It didn't mean they were confused by what was being said. They were confused with the how did this happen, right? They were, they were perplexed or, or confounded or uh, uh, unclear, we'll say, for, uh, you know, just leave it there. How in the world are they able to do this? Well, God has a message. God has a Savior that he wants the world to get acquainted with. And in order to do that, if he has to, God will pour out his spirit in a way that gives us voice to declare what needs to be said and what can be said to affect lives. Next verse, please. Now, if you would look at this in... Uh, probably in something like the Passion Translation or the Message Bible, they will give you more up-to-date, like, you know, northeastern Iran and south southeastern Iran and Turkey. And they'll, they'll give you some of the things that will resonate probably a little more clearly with our understanding of how the map is marked for our day and time. But let's just say that's, let's just look at this and say Parthians, Medes, Elamites, um, uh, dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia. So that's a wide range of dialects and languages and cultures. Even though uh, I will say this, there's not a lot of difference in the cultures, but since they're primarily Middle Eastern, there's still a lot of similarity. There's some differences, but not a lot. Next verse, please. Phrygia, Pamphylia in Egypt and in parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. One more. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So what? So this is a quite a broad spectrum. God has a word for the world, and it's a word of deliverance and salvation. It's a word that is life-changing. The church, the bride, steps forward and she begins to speak. So, so if you can, once they begin to grasp the idea and the message and the reality of it, it starts to put joy. Joy is restored. Gladness becomes part and parcel of their life. They begin to have something now to celebrate. Something now to, to have, they have some, uh, they have something that will lift them up and not hold them down. They have something now in their life that is engaging and, and, and intriguing and drawing and, and, and powerful and, and, and brings us to a, to a, to the forefront of everything that's been, that's happened. So, so in the sense of how, how Passover uh, affected the entire world. This Pentecost is now situated to amplify the voice of the bride and let that voice in tandem with the voice of the bridegroom now speak words of life, words of grace, words of healing, words of joy, 
words of gladness, and the world begins to be impacted and affected positively by the message of the gospel. It's called the good news or the glad tidings for a reason. It's not the, it's not the, the, uh, you know, the, it's not the news. We think of news, what we, what passes as news in our, you know, in our day and time is, is, is very negative and very uh, disquieting to say that, to put it mildly. But this was news that was designed to uplift, designed to empower, designed to liberate. Man, I tell you, when you start hearing the gospel and you realize that you're free, you realize that you're free from the, from the burden of sin, you realize that you're free from the bondage of it, from the guilt of it, from the shame of it, and you have a Savior now who has stood there and has borne the price, he's bled and died and rose again for you to have a new life, it changes everything. Verse 12. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What in the world does this mean? What meaneth this? Next verse. So in all of their all of their hearing and understanding, they still lack meaning. And I want to say this very clearly today. Sometimes we hear and we understand, but without meaning, we don't know what to do with what we've heard. What meaneth this? What is going on? Is this just some kind of a dramatization? Is this some kind of a show? And so you always have the faction and probably full disclosure, this is probably part of my tribe here. Because for everybody wants to know what it means, somebody's going to have an offhanded remark to say. That's what, you've been around me long enough to know that I, I have some of those. I have a tendency, a penchant, a uh, real bend that way, right? Anyway, others mocking, others just kind of probing, poking fun at it or or not really wanting to take it seriously. They make the statement, they're just, they're just drunk. They're just full of new wine. Got in a conversation with somebody years ago who was trying to explain to me that new wine was grape juice and old wine was wine. And I said, look, I don't want to argue with you. I said, no, I don't care whether you drink it or don't drink it. I mean, you know, I mean... If you can do it, and as long as the tail ain't wagging the dog, I guess that's, you know, I mean, that's going to be between you and your Savior. But, but what I want to get to here is that, is that I said, you know, if new wine was just grape juice, why did they think they were drunk on the day of Pentecost? There had to be some fermentational quality to it, right? I don't want to make this about that kind of behavior. Praise the Lord. But these men mocked and said, ah, they're just, you know, they're drunk, they're, they're just carrying on, it's just a bunch of, you know, or, you know, they may even be uh, folks that believe in, you know, the randomness of the universe, right? <laughs> anyway, next verse, please. These men are full of new wine, but Peter, standing up with the eleven. So here's what, here, this is so powerful to me. Because right now you've got the experience. Right now you've got the, the divine authority of the Holy Spirit. Heaven itself speaking, declaring, empowering, and, and causing a, a, a people to uh, be fully equipped and thoroughly prepared for what's in front of them. And so Peter, who had every, probably had as many reasons or more to uh, shy away and not step forward, becomes that very agent that steps forward. But I love the fact that when he stands up and he begins to speak, the other 11, hallelujah, stand up with him. Because what they're saying is, is we got this guy, what he's saying we believe. What he's got to say, we say the same thing. Everything he's declaring, we're amen. Everything that he's speaking into the world right now and speaking into your life about what has just transpired in these last few weeks, we're all 
settlement agreement. That's powerful to me. So he is the voice of the bride in this sense. And so he stands up and he begins to declare. He begins to say, he lifts up his voice. That means he got loud, right? And he said unto them, you men of Judea and all you that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. I need to tell you something, so I want you to listen to me. Next verse, please. These are not drunken as you suppose. He didn't say they weren't drunk. I'm sure they were kind of reeling around and, and, and uh, probably some a little bit of uh, trembling and a little bit of uh, shaking and a little bit of uh, other kind of manifestations because the manifestation of the Holy Spirit uh, affects our limited uh, ability to, to uh, take all that in. But he says these are not drunken as you suppose. He didn't say they weren't affected, but he did say they're not affected like you say. It's not new wine in the sense of literal new wine. And they are affected, but they're affected by the power from on high. They're affected by what Jesus has poured into our lives off of out of heaven. What has been, what has filled us with his glory and his majesty has situated us here for this time. Seeing it is but the third hour of the day, it's prayer time. If they were drunk at this hour, they've been drinking all night, and that ain't been the case, right? But that's where we got this is the third. That means it's 9 o'clock in the morning, and it's prayer time. And we're here at the temple. All this is happening. So think about this for a minute. Can you, can you imagine that in an upper room, they got all these thousands of people up there to hear what they were saying? That's why I think, it, that's why I think that it had migrated down to the down to the temple. I believe that it, the outpouring of it was there. The, the one accord, the singleness of mind and purpose that was in the upper room got carried down. Of that, there's no doubt, particularly through those 120. But it's just the third hour of the day. Next verse, please. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So the very thing that Peter says to them is, is that this is prophecy being fulfilled right before your eyes. How about that? The first thing he does is he says, he starts to tell them that the prophets are being fulfilled. That what had been spoken, what had been declared and prophesied, that that, that generation and that group was living in that hour when the prophetic was being fulfilled. Next verse, please. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. You can find this in Joel chapter 2. It shall come to pass in the last days. See, Peter was saying to them, what you're looking at, this manifestation, is a mark that says we're, the last days are on. Yeah. We're in the last days. Yeah. That was in, that was the Pentecost, almost 2,000 years ago, Right? I don't want to get into all this today because I, I don't want to do that. Uh, but he says it should come to pass the last days. He's saying the prophecy of Joel is now at hand. It's now happening. And it will come to pass in the last days. That's what the prophet said. So what Peter said is with this manifestation, you better understand and receive that we're in the last days. It's the time of the Messiah. It's the time of what's transpired. It's what the prophets had declared. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And I love this. This is so overlooked. Yeah. Because in the Jewish community, it was all about the guys. It was all about the husbands, the fathers, the patriarchs, right? And we live in a time where, where people talk about and call, uh, uh, call things a patriarch. And there's a certain amount of truth. There's enough truth in that. For you to get hung up on it and get tangled up in it. But I'm going to tell you something about the New Testament. The New Testament empowered women like no other document. The Holy Spirit made women alive like nothing else had up to that point. Hallelujah. I will pour out my spirit. I pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. 
So it's not just for sons, it's sons and daughters. So I'm, I'm going to pour out. So what I'm saying is, is there's a, so the, the, the metaphor of the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride is flows right into that, right? Because it's a male voice, it's a masculine voice, and it's a feminine voice. It has the, the attributes of the perspective, hallelujah, of male and female. As confounded as that is these days. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. That means that that means, ladies, that 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 you have the ability by the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to speak under the influence and unction of the Most High God with as much authority as any other guy in the house. Yeah, right. <coughs> oh, I thought I got a bigger cheer than that. <laughs> I'm not much of one for for pulling that stuff out, but but I'm telling you, you see. It's incredible to me that, the, that what the new Testament, what Jesus came to do, so revolutionized the world. Yeah. Monogamy is born of the New Testament. Yeah. Jewish custom, and what was uh, you know, and Middle Eastern custom, and of course Roman custom and Greek custom. You know, that was a pretty wide range of uh, definition for what it meant to be married and husband and wife. But because Jesus came and he showed us that he had a bride and that there was this trueness, there was this truth, there was this compatibility between him and his, and his bride that now Paul said that you know, he starts talking about being the husband of one wife. He starts talking about being a one woman man. Nobody in the world was saying that until Paul had the unction of the Holy Ghost to begin to teach and begin to put in writing all of those things. See, we overlook so much of this stuff. Forgive me, it kind of frustrates me a little bit. Because we let stuff slide over and we, you know, we talk like that, 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 that this is part of the problem. If it's part of the problem, it's because we've misunderstood and misrepresented the gospel. Because the gospel's inclusive. The gospel says sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. So it's not just, it's not just sons and daughters, it's it's young and old. It's, it, it, it is designed to impact the spectrum of human development and maturity and life as we know it. Next verse, please. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get you through this, get you out of here in just a minute. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, again, male, female, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. God's an equal opportunity filler of the Holy Ghost. Equal opportunity savior, deliverer, hallelujah. And you know, let me say this about our kids. You know, I mean, when your kids are old enough to have faith and believe now listen, there's nothing magical about, them, about particular ages because each kid is different. But if they get saved and they have an, and they have an encounter with Jesus, I'm going to tell you something, they didn't get a junior dose. They didn't get the Happy Meal salvation. <laughs> you know, tiny French fries. Little hamburger. Or only four nuggets. Sometimes we, you know, we think that, we, you know, we kind of minimize what God can do with kids. But I'm going to tell you, was it, the, the prophet said a child shall lead them, right? And sometimes there's the power of faith in children. Jesus, when they were arguing about who was greatest among them, what Jesus do? He said a child in the midst of them. And he said, look, he said, y'all want to be great? Look here. This is greatness. This is trust. This is something else. 
Isaiah talked about the, uh, you know, the playing in the, in, in the cockatrices did and all that stuff. And I'm not saying your kids ought to go out and play in snake holes. I'm saying that there's something about kids and the genuineness and the simplicity of faith that they are more capable than we realize. So be vigilant and be wise. Don't just let your default religious mindset smack them down. On my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. They shall speak words of encouragement. They shall speak words of life. They shall declare the majesty of the Lord and the purpose of the Lord. And they shall encourage the audience and the onlooker. And they will be able to speak with the authority of the Holy Spirit. What a day. What a day. That day's not over. Hallelujah. about to get this whip. Next day. Next verse. Excuse me. I might not quit there, huh? <laughs> he says, And I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood, fire, and vapor, smoke. Roll on. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. One more verse. And it shall come to pass. I love this. He starts talking about all these phenomenon, all these things that can happen. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord yeah. shall be saved. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. I know we formulize some things. Okay, you pray this prayer with me and I think you're okay. Sometimes we do that. Listen, I, that, that's not, I, don't, I don't mean to, to insinuate that that's evil because it's not. But sometimes faith is its own experience. And sometimes, sometimes we do things to make it formulaic because we need to feel better about your faith. And the reality of it is, is if you call on the name of the Lord, if your heart is genuine and it's open and it's honest and you speak out and you speak and you call on him and you present your heart in the presence of God, my God has the power to save you in that moment. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. He's going to go on here and he's going to... He's going to delineate what all happened recently and, and, and they're going to take the guilt and they're going to think, oh my God, we killed our Messiah. What can we do? And he's going to tell them that they can be absolved, that they can, they can walk away from that, that they can find in him absolution and remission of sins. So I'm going to tell you that no matter what you've done, God can save. God is a forgiving God. He's a good daddy. He's a good papa. He's a good God, and he will bring you, welcome you, run to meet you. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. But you need to hear the voice of the bride today because it is her voice that's being declared. Hallelujah. And this Pentecost is the fulfillment of that promise yeah. that the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride would be heard in the land. And so it is no wonder to me that Paul said in Romans 14 and 17, this is the power and work of the Holy Spirit that we're talking about today, still relevant, still part and parcel of what we're doing. We can never recapture that phenomenon initially, but we can still be participants in it and, and in our part in it and in our state and in our area to be used of God in the same, in a, in similarly. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, right now, I pray for each and every heart that's here. For each and every one, Father God, who is who has been enduring the sound of my voice, I pray, Father, if there's any doubt or any fear, 
Father, that they would just call on your name. And I pray right now that would speak out the name of Jesus. And say, Lord Jesus, have mercy. Save my life. Change me. Make me new. Hallelujah. Uh, change my life. I lift my heart to you and say in the name of Jesus, Father God, save such a one as me. Fill my life with your glory. I receive the fullness of your blessing and your spirit into my life. I say, Lord, I, I honor you and bless you. And I receive from heaven all that you have for me today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless you, Jesus. We give you praise. We give you glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you called on the name of the Lord, whether it was right now or whether it's been in your past, and you have you know that your heart is situated, I want you to give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Hallelujah. Go ahead. Give the Lord some praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.